Hey everyone, my name is Jose, and have you ever wondered what the future of smartphone photography looks like? Well, that's what I'm here to talk about. So to begin this video, let's talk about what makes smartphone cameras exceed. It's the software supporting the camera app. When you take a photo and immediately press to view it, you'll notice that the photo begins to load. And it's because the phone is processing the data it just captured. So essentially, the phone is processing the image data and putting it through an algorithm which it determines what the photo should look like. This is called computational photography because computing needs to be done in order to process and enhance the image. Computational photography can mean a range of things because processing an image isn't just a make a photo better situation. But in this video, we'll be referring to how computing image data makes smartphone cameras good. So when you take a photo with your smartphone, your phone has to decide which areas do I make the photo bright? Which parts should be dark? How should the colors look like? What is the foreground and background when shooting in portrait mode? There's a lot of different things your phone has to decide when taking a photo. And depending how good the photo processing algorithm is, that is mostly what results in an image looking good or bad. So why does computational photography exist? Like, what is it supposed to solve? Well, the answer to that actually comes down to two main parts. First, is that computational photography solves a problem that not everyone is a pro photographer and it gives us a usable image that helps us not needing to edit the image in order for it to be great and secondly is that it sort of solves problems due to hardware limitations of smartphone camera sensors to answer the first part if you want a good image of anything the most considerable thing to do is to shoot on an actual camera because that's what cameras do best. And smartphone cameras are, well, combining two separate things into one. Part of this answer goes into the second question, but the thing is, cameras are one thing and smartphone cameras are another. Whether you shoot on a camera or on a smartphone, a good end result involves you shooting in a raw image format like DNG or CR2, just to name a few file extensions out there. By shooting in a raw format, the image contains a lot of data that the camera sensor captured, and it is minimally processed so that the data is as untouched as it can be. Because of this, colors can look flat and dull, and the image is practically ugly. The beauty of raw images is that you can edit the image to look like whatever you want. You can easily manipulate the image to match that mental picture you have so that the image turns out the way you want it to look. But the thing is, not everyone has the time or skills or software to edit raw images. So what's the answer into making an image that is usable and it looks good and it satisfies that mental picture you have when capturing the photo? Well, that would be computational photography. So onto the second part of why computational photography exists. It solves hardware limitations. So let's take an iPhone 13 Pro Max and compare its photo quality capability with a traditional camera, like a Canon EOS Rebel T6. If I asked you which one had the better photo quality capability, would you still say the iPhone? No, that shouldn't be the case, but here's the thing. Our smartphone quality will generally be underwhelming compared to that Canon camera because of a few factors, but generally it's because of sensor size. Essentially, a camera sensor captures all the light information and converts it into an image, and a big camera sensor means it's more capable of showing you high dynamic range, which I'll explain later on, or it means that low light photography looks better. So the sensor size for the Canon camera is 1.05 inches diagonal 
and has a surface area of 332.3 millimeters squared. Okay, so how big do you think an iPhone camera sensor is? Half an inch maybe? Well, that information is kept unknown by Apple with what I believe to be 0.37 inches diagonal with a total sensor surface area of 44 millimeters squared. And this is backed up by DP review, so I think it's correct. The thing is, smartphone camera sensors aren't that big compared to traditional camera sensors. And because of this, the hardware can only do so much in bringing in light into the sensors, which bigger sensors bring more light more effortlessly. There's also more to this, like the physical aperture mechanism on cameras, which most smartphones don't have such a feature. But the reasons for computational photography make sense. It's because of convenience and to bypass hardware limitations. All right, I just want to briefly mention that although computational photography exists overall, with the point of it having an algorithmic process to make your photos look good, that not all phones will capture the exact same scene the same way. This is for a multitude of reasons, whether it be the specifications of the sensor itself, or maybe there's like additional sensors that help process the images, like how the P50 Pro has a 40 megapixel monochrome sensor. And yeah, of course, each phone has different algorithms and such. So maybe people buy iPhones because they like iPhone photos and other people buy other phones because they like those photo styles. Our tastes are never the same. This part of the video is going to make sense later in the video, but just know that smartphone cameras are pretty good, but it's only as good as we think is good. But what if I told you that this idea of judging camera quality between phones is going to change because of some upcoming photography apps that focus on computational processes? First, I would like to mention Mark Lavoie, who was an engineer at Google Research, where he made pixels capture great images thanks to his work in computational photography. But even before we had pixel phones, he developed HDR+, which debuted on the Nexus 5 and 6 phones back in 2014. And it acts as a precursor to what we have today with pixel phones. HDR Plus improves the images captured on Nexus and Pixel phones by taking multiple frames of your scene that's a mix of bright and dark shots and it blends them into one finalized image. The photo also goes through a denoising algorithm that removes noise and also becomes sharper as a result. Mark has also worked on other projects like bringing Night Sight to Pixel phones, so basically, Mark had a huge influence on making pixels have that high contrast look we have come to know, and computational algorithms are responsible for those photo enhancements. The last phone released during Mark's deployment at Google was the Pixel 4 as he left in July 2020 to work for Adobe. So now that he's at Adobe, what does that mean? Well, he's going to focus on computational photography for Adobe software, but more specifically, he's going to work on a universal camera app. Essentially, imagine if you can take all the great features about the Pixel camera app and how it takes those Pixel HDR plus signatures photos and you can replicate that experience on a completely different phone like an iPhone. Here's a part of the video where now we get to talk about interesting things. Okay, so about that universal camera app from Adobe. All we know is that Mark Lavoie, the person associated with the success of Pixel cameras, is trying to bring that success to other smartphones. Just imagine downloading this camera app from Adobe, whether you have a top of the line flagship like the iPhone 13, or maybe you have an older model of phone like the OnePlus 7. 
but through the power of Mark's camera app, you will achieve impressive results on both. This camera app is going to be really good for two reasons. One is that we have Mark Lavoy developing this project, and two, Adobe software itself is just really good software. We all know about Adobe products like Adobe Premiere, Adobe Photoshop, Lightroom, After Effects, and more, but I'm pretty sure that content producers and content creators can agree that Adobe software is just industry leading. Not only that, but Adobe themselves is a really successful company that is worth more than $200 billion. And everything Adobe makes is essentially a success. Like, do they ever so rarely fail at anything? So given this logic of Adobe and Mark's success, this universal camera app isn't going to be just another camera app. It has to be an extremely competitive camera app that rivals pixels, iPhones, Huawei phones. It just has to be good. It has to be good because of what we've seen of Mark's time working at Google and how pixel phones use computational photography to make pixel photos great. And so I expect better, if not similar results for the Adobe camera app. Also, how cool would it be to have a good camera phone that was also repairable and had like five years of Android updates? I'm talking about Fairphone and the Adobe camera app. Just a quick, just a quick note that this can easily be a reality if this actually comes true. Also, leave me a comment down below on what you think the Adobe camera app is going to be called. So far, besides like Adobe Cam or Adobe Camera, I think it could be called like Adobe Mirror, Adobe Reflect, Adobe Sense. And I'll talk about later why I think it's going to be called Adobe Sense. But yeah, let me know down below on what you think this Adobe Camera app could be called. Okay, so while we wait for this Adobe Camera app to release, is there anything else that uses computational photography so that we can get really good and HDR-like images. Well, besides your default camera app, I would like to introduce you to Photon Camera. Photon Camera is an open source project that aims to give you HDR images by stacking up to 50 frames, combining them into the final output. Now, 50 frames is seriously a lot. That's a lot of frames. And just for context, the Pixel 4, which Mark Lavoie worked on, had a maximum of nine frames for HDR Plus to blend those frames together. Now, there is diminishing returns to having 50 frames blended for the photo, but by default, the camera app is set to have a maximum of 30 frames blended for HDR. So that's over three times the amount of frames the Pixel 4 could do. But here, I'll tell you about my experiences and show you my findings about using Photon Camera. To start, the app's code can be found on its GitHub page where it can be downloaded, but it's also available on the Google Play Store for that easy downloading convenience. Keep in mind that this app is in beta so everything from the look of the UI to the photo results are subject to change and not finalized. Inside the app, you'll find that the UI is pretty similar to other manufacturer camera apps. So there's like no learning curve or there's nothing needed additionally for you to use or navigate the app. On the top row, you'll see features like electronic image stabilization, which I highly recommend to be on. And you'll find other things like timer, flashlight settings, a uh, photo grid, just basic things. I also like the simple toggle where you can switch between camera lenses, but depending on the app support, it won't use all the camera lenses. Like my Xiaomi Poco X3 Pro has a macro sensor, 
but in the Photon Camera app, the macro sensor did not show up as an available toggle. But do you know what I found to be absolutely shocking when using the Photon Camera app? You can take pictures using the depth sensor. Yeah, so for one of the toggles, it switches to this really grainy and monochrome sensor, which is the depth sensor. I kind of always knew that depth sensors and monochrome sensors were like essentially the same thing, excluding LiDAR and time of flight sensors. But yeah, this is actually just really cool. Before you ask, I highly don't recommend you take any photos on the monochrome or depth sensor because usually these sensors are like two megapixels and are not practical in most cases. So when you do shoot on the depth sensor, you'll see that your photo is heavily tinted to magenta and this is because of automatic white balance. You could just desaturate the photo by 100% and use a monochrome photo, but yeah. Again, I highly do not recommend that you shoot on the depth sensors to get a monochrome photo because if you just want a monochrome photo, just do it with your default camera app. You'll get better results by using your default camera app where that default camera app is going to use both your main camera and that depth sensor to combine into having a monochrome image. At least that's how the 8T did it. Again, truly, truly insane. And I'm very glad that I now know what depth sensors view image data as. So before we get to the photo results, I just want to say that I tested Photon Camera on the OnePlus 5T, the OnePlus 8T, the Poco X3 Pro, and the Red Magic 6R, just because they have okay camera quality already. Not only that, but I wanted to see if Photon Camera can make older phones and newer phones take better photo quality. Also, out of the four phones I tested, PCAM, which is just short for Photon Camera, um, is only so officially supported on the Poco X3 Pro out of the devices I had with me. So that means that the Poco has certain tweaks that make compatibility better on the Poco X3 Pro, while the other phones do not have those tweaks for compatibility. You can still use PCAM on a wide range of unsupported devices, but you might encounter some issues like how I did. But besides that, let's check out the photo results. Starting off with the OnePlus 5T, which actually has two RGB sensors for whatever reason, probably to blend the images in HDR and stuff. But Photon Camera is incapable of using both RGB sensors at that same time. So let's see if this trade-off is worth it with Photon Camera. The 5T is better saturated and has better contrast but with the green tint. While PCAM kind of casted a cold look if you look at the red barn to the right and is overall a darker image. So I think the 5T did it best here. Also, I'm going to be going over the next photos really quickly because I took a lot of photos and we still have the other phones to go through. So sorry, it's not that in depth of a uh, camera comparison. This is just more of a quick overview. But yeah, this video would be unnecessarily long if I did that. 5T did better, especially with contrast. Both are good, but the shadows are brighter on the 5T with the tree to the right side. PCAM is better because of the white balance and saturation. PCAM again on this one. 5T is brighter here. PCAM here and pay attention to this one because PCAM pretty much wins on this exact scene in the other ones. 5T here. PCAM here, 5T here. And 5T wins both night shots, which here is actually a historical McDonald's restaurant located in Downey. Summary for the 5T is that 
both the 5T and PCAM are good, but PCAM kind of takes really dark shadows and the white balance can sometimes be off like when it's cold. But yeah, the 5T sort of wins this one. PCAM is still like good, but it does require manual tweaking. Now for the OnePlus 8T, we'll actually have to skip a comparison between the 8T and PCAM because PCAM does not work on the OnePlus 8T. If you were to take a photo while on PCAM, the app just crashes and you don't get any photo results. I know it's a shame, but I do have something planned later in the video for the 8T, so we'll just skip the 8T for now. Next up, we have the Poco X3 Pro, which is a supported device to be used on PCAM. First up, we have Paul Revere. If you notice, the PCAM photo already looks similar to what we've seen with the 5T's PCAM photo. For the same reasons, the Poco wins this time with better contrast, saturation, and light balance. The photo of the flowers, however, goes to PCAM because of how realistic the highlights are with the grass, and it's not a bright mess like the default camera did. That one was a really significant difference. The photo of a pond is actually a tie because one photo looks bright, and the PCAM photo looks more natural and realistic, especially with the shadows on the wall. PCAM wins on this one with better saturation and contrast with the Canon. PCAM wins here for similar reasons. PCAM wins here because I thought the colors were captured more realistically. This photo is one with the ultra wide, and I give the win to the Poco phone because it's a brighter photo. Remember how I told you to pay attention to the wheel? Yeah, PCAM wins here. Poco wins this photo because it's bright. I'm calling a tie with the house photo because they look very similar to each other and I won't declare a clear winner. Poco wins this photo. We are on the ultra wide camera and Poco wins this one. Poco wins this photo because PCAM had bad exposure control. This photo is kind of a close one, but Poco wins because it has better white balance, as seen with the yellow lights on the building. Last, we have a selfie, and it's kind of difficult for me to choose one, even though they look very different. However, I will pick the Poco because it's a little bit more sharper with my hair and shirt details. Finally, we have the Red Magic 6R. With Paul Revere, once again, we have like the same scene across all PCAM photos, which I'll elaborate on later. But yeah, the 6R wins here. PCAM wins with the flowers because the exposure is controlled a lot more. I think PCAM wins here, even though the 6R photo is similar with what we've seen with the other default cameras. I just think that the PCAM photo looks very realistic and balanced. I really don't know why the phones keep failing with the Canon, so the PCAM wins here. PCAM wins again with the rocks, it's a lot more punchy with the colors. The 6R wins because PCAM is a little bit dark. Now onto the ultra wide shot, PCAM wins because it has better white balance. With the wheel photo, PCAM wins again. 6R wins here with the flowers. Again, this photo scene is just a tie because I think both photos look pretty good here. 6R wins this one. Onto the ultra wide shot, PCAM wins because of the white balance. I have no idea why PCAM is so dark here, so 6R wins. And 6R wins on the last night photo. Last, we have the selfie, and PCAM wins because the 6R is kind of dark. PCAM had some pretty consistent results in some scenes across all phones, and if PCAM can have this consistency, then it makes sense for Adobe Camera to be the same, where you can have the same photo results across a bunch of phones. Also, instead of HDR+, Plus, like how we get it on Pixel phones in PCAM, it's called HDRX, so it's 
is kind of funny. Pretty cool though. Last few things about the camera app is that there's an option for video, but when you actually press the button, a photo actually triggers. Um, I'm not sure why this happens, but you gotta remember that this app is in beta, so this can be fixed anytime soon. There's also a night mode, which I'm guessing is also broken because when you use that, it just takes the same amount of time as the regular mode to take a photo and the photo themselves are not that different and night mode overall night photography on photon camera takes an absurd amount of time sometimes over like 30 seconds just to take a single photo that doesn't make any sense but yeah night photography on pcam is just broken and borderline unusable there's also an unlimited mode, which basically lets in all the light for as long as you want. So it's basically equivalent to a mode like a star trails mode or a traffic light mode where you just capture the movement of stars or cars. And I think it's pretty cool that it's in this app because it benefits from that computational photography aspect of HDR. Again, everything here is in beta, and even though it is in beta, the computational processes here are actually really awesome. So while I'm glad that Photon Camera exists and everything, I'm even more glad to hear that there are other projects out there just like Photon Camera, and that's why I'm introducing you to Motion Cam. Motion Cam is another open source project listed on GitHub, and it seems to bring the same computational photography approach for HDR purposes. But from what I've seen with the GitHub page and the Google Play Store listing, and even inside the app, the computational photography aspect kind of relies more on denoising your photos than it is about HDR. But besides that, it's still focused on computational photography nonetheless, so let's have a look at it. The camera app has a pretty simple UI, but I find the settings for ISO and shutter speed to be pretty buggy. Like if you want to change your ISO, you have to tap multiple times to cycle through the different ISO settings until you find the one you want best. And it's the same thing when selecting for shutter speed settings. And if you want to reset these settings, you have to press the auto button, which is kind of confusing at a first glance, but it does make sense that the auto button does reset the settings. I think a wheel cycle will be way easier to navigate for the shutter speed and ISO settings. So if a wheel cycle ever gets added, then this camera will be easier to use. I do like the toggles for the camera sensors with the big circle being the main sensor and the smaller circles being the other sensors. But I do think that the circles themselves either need to be bigger or spaced out better because I always misclick on the wrong sensor all the time. And yes, you can still use the depth sensor to take monochrome photos, but the same thing applies here where all of your photos will have a magenta tint applied because of the automatic white balance. But one of the coolest features for motion cam is that the app has sliders for contrast and exposure. If you're familiar with the Pixel camera app, then you'll know about the dual controls where you get to control the exposure and contrast in real time before you take a photo. And it's really cool that it's on another app and that, yeah, it's on motion cam. Last thing is that the settings for motion cam has a lot of experimental features. So just be careful about changing these values because that could potentially break the app. Now onto the photo results, starting with the OnePlus 5T. Um, yeah, all of the motion cam photos pretty much look bad because it doesn't have enough saturation or contrast. Like all the photos look like a ghost town or something and the white balance is just completely off. Um, how does it look on the OnePlus 8T? Yeah, same thing here with an off white balance that just gives everything a grunge look. It's pretty strange to see. Just to spare you the time, the Pocophone and the 6R are very similar to this. So why is this happening? 
The easy answer is that although Motion Cam is a computational photography app, the app seriously requires user input in order to make the photos look good. So the camera settings need to be fixed on a user to user basis for every single different smartphone model because everything from the likes of saturation, contrast, brightness, white balance, you name it, needs to be fixed by the user. So this means that motion cam is for those who know how to change the default camera settings into making the camera capture better looking photos. So that kind of means that motion cam can't really be used by ordinary people looking for a point and shoot experience. I know it's a shame, but that's just how the app is developed. One of the biggest features about motion cam is the ability to shoot video in a raw file format. I personally don't find myself using this feature at all, but it does make sense who, for those who want to shoot raw video on their smartphone so that they could color grade it and edit the video footage better. So something I did is that I ran a poll online to see what photos people like best across photon camera and motion camera and the default camera app across all four phones I've tested previously with PCAM and motion cam. And I was sort of experimenting to see what makes someone choose a photo over another photo. Is bright photos better or are more darker yet realistic photos better? So that's the data I'm about to analyze and we are about to go over. And the results are in with 12 total respondents, which I know is a really small sample. I was trying to aim for at least 30 respondents, but you know what, 12 would do for now. So let's go over it. Now I won't go over all the answers selected because that would take forever. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm only going to be going over the photos where they were neck and neck, almost pretty much tied to see, you know, what was the difference between selecting one photo or the other. So with the Poco phone about the flower scene, 58 preferred the default photo with 42% on the PCAM. I would have thought that the realistic PCAM photo would have won, but people are tied between a bright and dark photo. With another Poco photo, it was evenly split between the PCAM and the default photo. Now both photos are very, very similar. So I wonder what influenced one response over the other. Again, even split with another Poco photo and the ultra wide shot. One photo is bright while the other is dark. It makes sense for the bright photo to win, but that wasn't the case with the tie. The Poco selfie is also split between the default and PCAM one. Very, very interesting. On the OnePlus 8T, it was evenly split between default camera and motion cam. I can sort of see why. There's a few more I could do, but the last one I want to do is on the Red Magic 6R. The motion camera photo won by 92%. Yeah, it actually makes sense why. Okay, so here's a very important question. What's better? A bright photo where the shadow details are brighter than what is seen in a real life perspective or a realistic photo where both highlights and shadows are realistic to what is seen in a real life perspective, even if I meant the whole photo was a little bit dark. So you tell me. And in my survey, 67% of respondents said that a bright photo is better than a realistic photo. Now, my opinion and the opinion of others can be absolutely different. Like maybe you like bright photos where the shadows are unrealistic, or maybe you like realistic photos where there is realism between the highlights and shadows and just contrast overall. The choice is absolutely up to you, which is why in photon camera and motion camera, you can change up the settings so that the photos can turn out how you want them to turn out. In photon camera, you can change up the values for sharpness, saturation, noise reduction, and shadows. I think the two main values people are going to change is saturation and shadows because sometimes the photos could be more vivid and other times the shadows could be boosted. 
In motion cam, you can change a lot more settings. You can change the contrast, saturation, white balance, sharpness, and detail. Now, I was confused about what's the difference between sharpness and detail in motion cam. And I found out that sharpness is just regular old sharpness, but detail remains to be unknown. I thought it had to do with noise reduction or something similar to that, but nah, not in my testing. It doesn't appear to be so. Also, unlike Photon Camera, Motion Cam requires you to change the settings around so that the photo quality is actually good on your device. Like on the OnePlus 5T, where Motion Cam took low contrast and just bad overall photos, you have to experiment with Motion Cam on your device so that you can find a combination of settings that not only fits what you like, but also is right for your device. So because of this, I can sort of see why motion cam is pretty much for those knowledgeable about camera settings and can understand what is lacking from the default motion cam photos it takes. Okay, so I just covered two open source projects, which would be Photon Camera and Motion Cam, which are still in development, but I just want to quickly go over two very popular camera apps, which that would be the ones on Pixel phones and iPhones. Now, the reason I bring them up have nothing to do with app design or anything about the apps themselves, but rather it's because these apps are the gateway to computational photography algorithms on those respective devices. So we all know that the Pixel camera app is good because it has features like dual exposure and such. But the thing is, so many people love the Pixel Camera app and actually want to try the Pixel Camera app that they've ported over the camera app over to non-Pixel Android phones. However, the Pixel Camera app is only supposed to work on, well, Pixel phones. So the app itself needs tweaks if you want to port it over to another Android phone like a Motorola phone, for example. There's an XDA developers page about finding a working Google camera app or Gcam for short to work on your phone across a wide range of manufacturer and models. If you broadly search on the internet about how to get Gcam on any specific device, you'll find a whole bunch of pages with tutorials and videos about how to port over Gcam to that specific model. And the reason there's so many videos about this is because I guess people really want to try out HDR plus and are just in love with that technology. As cool as Gcam is, I, I, I have to say that I don't recommend you follow any of the tutorials you find online because it sort of involves you downloading the APK for Gcam from an unknown source. And because of that, there's a chance that the APK was tampered with. Well, it had to be tampered with because how else can you get a working Gcam for like a Motorola phone, for example? So because of this, I kind of think that just the Gcam APKs you find online have a good chance that they can have spyware and such, which is why I can't really recommend that you follow any of the videos you find online for Gcam. Unless you can download Gcam from a reputable source where you can sort of audit and trust that the source code or any changes made to the Gcam APK are legitimate and are not riddled with spyware, then that's still completely up to you because you would still have to assess the risks to see if the Gcam APK you are installing is trustworthy. Other than that, Gcam is respected by a lot of people because it has something like HDR+. But you know, what about other computational processes on other camera apps, like on the iPhone? In 2019, Apple unveiled Deep Fusion, which shoots a maximum of 9 frames and blends them together in order to sharpen the image and reduce noise. As Phil Schiller describes the technology. It is computational photography mad science. It is way cool. 
Deep fusion only really works in medium lit environments, so like an indoor environment, for example, and it kind of doesn't really apply itself to either day or nighttime photos. But yeah, the reason I bring up deep fusion is although it only works best in some scenarios, it's still computational photography available on a very popular camera phone, the iPhone. From just basic samples you can find online about deep fusion, well, it works. But what if you can bring this technology to another phone like the Poco? What if HDR Plus with its 100% full capability using those proprietary algorithms for computational photography came to the Poco phone? What if Super Res Zoom came to the Poco phone and all you had to do was install an app? Don't forget that Photon Camera works, Motion Cam works, the Gcam ports for other phones work. This is all possible. Especially don't forget that Adobe has yet to enter the scene with their own Adobe camera app with Mark Lavoy on that project. So far, it looks like Mark has worked on the Photoshop camera app, which is a different kind of computational photography than what I have been talking about throughout this whole video. Instead of making photos better, like how we seen with computational photography on pixels and iPhones, it looks like this is more of a filter based computational photography app where you give your photos more of an art style than it is really neutral looking photos. Now going back to what the potential name of the Adobe camera app can be called. Remember when I said that the Adobe Camera app could be called something like Adobe Sense? Well, that's because of something called Adobe Sensei. To put it short, Adobe Sensei is a generalized term for AI functionality that is seen across a lot of different Adobe applications. So Adobe Sensei can do things like predict analytics and figures for something like Adobe Analysis products, but it can also do other things like smart erase objects in videos. And guess who's on the Adobe Sensei team? That's right, Mark is on that team. Everything is just lining up so perfectly for this Adobe Camera app. Not only because Mark is on that Adobe Sensei project, but also because Adobe already has computational algorithms like the Smart Erase feature. Okay, to finalize my thoughts, computational photography is very important for a lot of different reasons. It makes smartphone cameras bypass the limitations they have because of their hardware, but more importantly, it's like magic. If you just want to point and shoot at something and hope that the photo will turn out good, well, you can because of computational photography. It's just easy and convenient knowing that you can shoot at something and know that it's going to have good contrast, good sharpness, good noise reduction, and just good everything. This is why people can trust their iPhones and Pixels to take good photos. And it's because they know that the computational photography can support those ideals of what makes a good photo in the first place. Even if you don't have a phone that takes good photos, you can install Photon Camera and Motion Cam and just experiment with those camera apps to see how can I make my photos look better by using these apps? And then your photos turn out the way you want them to look. And what's even cooler is that this computational photography provided by Photon Camera and Motion Cam is open source. So you can modify the source code and improve on it and just do whatever you want with these apps. 
it's computational photography that is free for everyone to use. Granted, it's still in development and compatibility between devices will definitely vary. I'm all for free and open source projects and I support both built on camera and motion cam, but this Adobe camera app, it just, it just has to be good. It just has to be good that so many people are going to want to download this app and see the impressive results on their own devices. Mark has said that the Adobe camera app has to overcome challenges like the different sensor sizes and just sensors overall and chips and image signal processors and everything that's practically different on every single smartphone. But the end result is that if you download the Adobe camera app, the photo you take of one specific scene should be replicated on a completely different model. It should be the same photo that you take no matter what phone you have. It is a universal camera app. And also since it's Adobe, like there's no way they're going to let people download this app for free, this really amazing camera app for free. Like there has to be a business model behind this camera app, just like how there's prices and subscriptions for like Adobe Creative Cloud and stuff like that. So yeah, I do think that this Adobe camera app kind of has to be locked behind a subscription. But the thing is, how expensive is a camera app going to cost? Like, is it going to cost $1 a month, $2 a month, four, five, six, seven dollars a month? Like, I really don't know. Um, I think anything higher than $3 or $4 is kind of hard to justify unless this camera app is like beyond revolutionary, then that justification kind of makes more sense for it. But yeah, you can really tell that I'm really rooting for all of these three apps to succeed. But in the end, it would be an awesome future knowing that if I want my phone to take better photos, maybe I don't need to buy a new phone to fulfill those photography expectations I have. Maybe, maybe, just, just maybe, instead, all I have to do is get my existing phone, go on the App Store, and just download a computational photography app. If you enjoyed this video, then please give me a like. And if you didn't like what you see, I just caught you in 4K, HDR, 60fps, raw file, for my cringe book. <laughs> but if you did like the video, please like, comment, and subscribe. Yeah, that's right. Subscribe. Subscribe to my channel right here, homie. Right here. <laughs> and yeah. And I'll be sure to post updates about Photon Camera, Motion Cam, and even the Adobe Camera app when that eventually comes out. So yeah, stay tuned for my upcoming videos about these camera apps when they do have updates to them. I'll also have a link in the description about all the camera samples I took so that you can have a closer look between the default camera motion cam and photon camera and just judge the photos for yourself and maybe even come back to this video and let me know your thoughts about all the applications I use and the phones too. Also, I'm planning on making a video about computational photography once again, but in this time, it's going to be about AI scene detection, where if you have like a Xiaomi phone or a Huawei phone, you're pretty familiar with AI scene detection, where your phone detects like a scene, like a flower, maybe a human subject or the sky or something, and it makes adjustments to your photo. And I'll be talking about, you know, is this AI scene detection computational photography, is it like good? Is it bad? You know, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. But in my opinion, I think some 
companies like Huawei do it best. But we'll have to wait and let you decide about that. Anyways, thank you for watching and a special thank you to the 12 respondents for my survey. Thank you. You gave me a lot of insight to all the photos I took. Thank, thank you very much. And yeah, anyways, I hope you check out Photon Cam, Motion Cam, the Adobe Camera app. Well, the Adobe Photoshop Camera app. <laughs> not, not yet. Not, not the Adobe Camera app. Not yet, not yet. But when it does come out, you already know. You already know. Okay. So yeah, thank you for watching and yeah, bye bye.